10 years ago, I came to know of this Buddhist monk. His name was Venerable Puliang, and he was executed by the Japanese after the fall of Singapore. My friends knew what happened to him, but nobody knew why he was executed. And one of them said to me, hey, why don't you go find out? And I did. That took me back to Singapore of the 1930s. At that time, Southeast Asia was collectively known as Nanyang. And the Chinese had settled in Singapore for generations. They built social institutions like clan association, temples, and monasteries to fulfill their social needs. The Xiongnan Monastery was one such example. Founded in 1898, it was the first Chinese Mahayana monastery in Singapore, attracting both devotees and tourists. Buddhist monasteries need Sangha members to serve. So it was in this context that Venerable Puliang arrived in 1912. In 1917, he became the 10th abbot of the monastery. He also initiated the first restoration project of the monastery, and a pair of stone tablets commemorating the event still stands today, and it's one of the rare material culture that is directly related to him. Now, in 1937, something major happened. Something happened that changed the life of millions of people. This event was the Sino-Japanese War. The Japanese were confident they could conquer China in three months, but they never anticipate the level of resistance, not only from the people in China, but people outside of China. In Southeast Asia, the Chinese leaders established the China Relief Fund. They wanted to raise money to support China. China Relief Fund was the first regional Chinese organization in the history of Southeast Asia. It was also one that united people across society. The very wealthy gave monthly donations to China Relief Fund. Newlyweds would ask that people not buy them wedding gifts, give a donation to China Relief Fund in their name. The hawkers would identify certain days of the week or of the month where they would donate their entire revenue to China Relief Fund. Now, while all of this was going on, Venerable Pu Liang was working on his second restoration project. But to continue with the restoration would mean competing with China Relief Fund for resources. So he decided to stop his restoration project and support China Relief Fund. His most high-profile event was a vegetarian fundraiser in 1939, in just one day, he raised more than $10,000, equivalent to about two to three years, an average worker's salary. That event was highly publicized in the press of the day. Now back to China. As the Sino-Japanese war progressed, the Japanese established more and more control over the Chinese sea coast. The government had to respond because they depended on the ports to bring in all of the war material. So alternative supply lines have to be established. One of them involved shipping the war material to Yangon in British Burma, and then by rail up to Laosho. From Laosho, the goods had to be sent by road into Kunming, and this road had to be constructed. And this road was the famous Burma Road. And this is how the Burma Road looked like. Now, you have a road, but you need drivers. You also need mechanics to sustain the flow of goods. But China did not have enough drivers or mechanics. So China Relief Fund was asked to recruit drivers and mechanics from Southeast Asia. This was the first advertisement that they put up in 1939. So between February to September 1939, 3,200 volunteers left Southeast Asia to serve on the Burma Road. These drivers, were all, drivers and mechanics were collectively known as the Nanyang Volunteers. 
Although people assume these 3,200 volunteers were Chinese men, but that was not the case because there were also some Indians, there were also some Malays, and four women drivers, Chinese women drivers, whom I was told were very good drivers. <laughs> now, as China Relief Fund was recruiting the drivers, they also found some people who were really passionate about going to serve, but whose driving skills needs improvement. They decided, hey, why not train them and then allow them to go? But in order to do that, they need somebody who is trustworthy and who has a place for them to build a driving school. And that person turned out to be Venerable Puliang. He allowed the driving school to be set up inside the monastery. So several batches of volunteers live in the monastery, were trained, and then left for service in China. The 3,200 Nanyang volunteers, many of them died during service. Some died of malaria. Some died because of accidents on the Burma Road. Others were killed when the Japanese conducted air raids over the Burma Road. Those who did not manage to escape after the fall of Burma were also rounded up by the Japanese. They were either shot on the spot or buried alive. Now, when the Nanyang volunteers sailed off the harbour, they usually sang to themselves a song called Goodbye Nanyang. They bid farewell to their new their second homeland, but it was also the last time they saw their family members, and it was also the last time the family members saw them. Because for a lot of people who were supporting China Relief Fund, they can be said to have participated in this war from the relative safety of Singapore, of British Singapore. They never expect the war to arrive, but it did. 15 February 1942, the British surrendered, and the Japanese launched the Chinese massacre Sokcheng. Their target was China Relief Fund leaders, and anybody who was involved in the recruitment and training of Nanyang volunteers. A group of soldiers arrived in Xiongnan Monastery, arrested Venerable Puliang, took him to Changi Beach, where he was executed. When I first started on this journey, I had no end game in plan. It was largely a self-funded solo journey. I just wanted to collect as much information as I could. I wanted to find out what happened. But along the way, I collected a lot of data, and I decided I need to put them all together and have it published into a book. Because as long as a copy of this book exists, this history will not be forgotten. And this history cannot be denied. The book was launched in uh, 2009. After the launch of the book, I decided maybe a documentary will help to spread this history faster and to a wider audience. So I began working on a documentary. Working on the documentary, men having to look at a lot of original war footages. It was very difficult to look at all of those scenes. And I was trying to, I was struggling if I should include them in the documentary. Then I got an answer. In one of the footage, a little kid was dragged to be executed. So I realized I had a choice, and I'm trying to choose if I want to include the war footage. But this child was not given a choice. He, were ne he was never asked if he wanted to leave or not. So the decision was taken to put the war footages in so that people can see war as it is. Now, 10 years into this journey, I look back and I see all of these people Something happened, something happened outside of their control, and it changed their lives for, forever. But 
the response that they made, the choices that they made, in turn changed the course of history. They became the agents of change. So, in the same way, if you and I all believe in peace, we could also become agents of change to make this world a better place for us and for the future generation. And that, I think, is the best tribute to all of these people who give up the, their lives for greater good of society. Thank you.